Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about what the RFC did and how it applies to today. So a little bit of this has already been covered. In 1939, the United States had somewhere between the 17th to the 19th smallest army in the world. It was almost insignificant. It was smaller than Portugal. We only had about 2,500 planes that had been mentioned. Maybe if you're generous, about 200 were useful for combat, but the, they might not have survived very long. In terms of production, we um, just two things I'm going to look at, aluminum and synthetic rubber. Um, aluminum was 164,000 tons and, and synthetic rubber was basically nowhere. It was a little bit that was uh, experimental. And then just uh, four, four to five years later, the Army was 30 times uh, larger. We had 80,000 planes and stunningly we were producing 8,000 planes a month, which no one believed could ever happen. Aluminum was up. Um, almost by a factor of 10, and synthetic rubber was nil, near a million pounds. Um, and among others, uh, for that plane production, uh, some of the planes, of course, were the B-24, which were coming off of uh, Ford's River Rouge plant, and um, they were producing one plane an hour, finally, in 1945, with 110,000 parts in it. And that's also something that no one ever believed could happen. And all of this, of course, was because of the RFC and uh, cooperation. So going into uh, World War II, there were bets placed by both Hitler and Tojo as to how the war would go. And so uh, Hitler, of course, in Nazi Germany, uh, felt that they would defeat, that his uh, form of government would win out over democracy because basically US industry was too profit hungry to work together. And they had basically had created an amalgam of uh, industry and government, and he felt that that was vastly superior to anything the United States could ever do. And in uh, Japan, basically Tojo and the, and the War Council felt that the disparate racial and social groups in the United States would never be able to cooperate. And of course, this was the view of a homogeneous culture that was bringing war to the world so that they could all experience the uh, superiority of uh, Imperial Japan. And so basically then to win this battle, um, government, the, basically the racial and social groups all work together, and especially industry and government work together. And this is where the production miracle came from, as the United States literally went from a dead stop to outproducing the combined combination of Japan and Germany in just two and a half years. And both of those countries had a 10-year running start to get into war production. And this was because of the loans from the RFC and the cooperation between government. And so among others, we've talked about synthetic rubber. So as an example, there was basically at the start of the war, there was a question is like, what was the most important thing to do? And it actually wound up, if you read Donald Nelson's The Arsenal of Democracy, it turns out buying some ore carriers to get more ore to uh, steel uh, for steel production was the most important thing right at the start of the war. And it turns out the steel that was made from that or those early ore carriers went, went into the planes that helped build uh, win the battle of Midway. It was that tight a race to um, win, win World War II. But also synthetic rubber it turned out then became the or rubber became the most important and valuable commodity in the entire country because everything either required rubber, whether it was being made for the production facilities or going into it. So for instance, a tank needed a ton of rubber, um, a battleship 75 tons, every um, uh, person in combat, um, needed 20, uh, 32 pounds of rubber for all of their gear and sh sh uh, um, shoes and everything else. And so creating the synth synthetic rubber industry, went, which was basically, um, uh, there was nothing existed beforehand, was part of the RFC's work to uh, get five first um, uh, test plants going, which were criticized as being an outrageous waste of money. And then in three months later, after it became clear of just how crippling the shortage would be, um, Jesse Jones was criticized for not moving quickly enough and that why weren't these plants bigger and producing more because it was going to take a while to get them going. Some of the others also, what we got from the enormous industrial effort and the cooperation between government and industry was uh, advanced metal manufacturing, where um, vanadium, tungsten, uh, uh, titanium, um, and aluminum were all, be, we learned how to produce them in industrial quantities and manufacture them in industrial quantities. Of course, I talked about the River Rouge plant with producing a B-24 every uh, hour. And of course, the um, 
B-29, which cost three times the amount of the to create the atomic bomb to carry it. And both of those led to the modern civilian aircraft industry and, and why U.S. has been basically first in aerospace for so many decades afterwards. The machine tools, um, there was a machine tool that was created that would literally weld a Sherman tank. They discovered that they could produce them several times faster if they welded them together, but that was a time consuming process. And someone came up with a jig that basically took the entire tank and spun it around and welded it. And so this is what enabled us to outproduce uh, Germany and win the, the tank battle. Steel, we learned how to produce enormous quantities in both uh, plate and sheet. And the entire petrochemical industry was pretty much born during World War II. Um, it had, there had been some of it, of course, beforehand, but the explosion in synthetics and the realization of what you could do with uh, petrochemicals came from World War II. And then finally, pharmaceuticals, um, the little known effort to get the volume production of penicillin which uh, turns out there was a, a moldy cantaloupe that was found in a supermarket um, by one of the administrative staff, a woman who was shopping and they were told anything that's uh, moldy. And so this uh, turned out to be the grandfather of all penicillin that's used today because um, it would grow through a volume of liquid rather than just on the surface. And there's arguments as to like what helped win World War II? Was it the uh, B-29? Was it all the things you, I've just talked about? Was it the atomic bomb? And there's a, a significant argument to be made that it was penicillin. Why? Because more people for the first time in any war um, died in combat than died from wounds after the war and it saved millions of lives. So where are we today? And so how does this apply today? So the, the question is, was of course Senator Manchin said, uh, Biden was not elected to be Roosevelt. And so this begs the question, do we need a Roosevelt today? And uh, the answer winds up being absolutely yes. And why is this? Well, if you look backwards, you can convince yourself that uh, Senator Manchin has that we're still in the post-World War II bloom phase with the golden era. Annual growth is four to 6%. Most of our infrastructure is new or under 50% of its design life. Coal will be a major fuel for the next 50 years. And the United States has the number one infrastructure in the world. And the reality, um, most of our infrastructure is 50 to 100% past its design life. GDP growth is only 1.7 to 2.3%, or one third to one quarter, with uh, corresponding uh, dramatic loss in tax revenue. Um, uh, especially for West Virginia, the lowest quartile or 20% of the country has seen their income decline over the last 40 years. They're not part of the booming stock and bond crowd who've uh, done so well. Um, for, in fact, 40% of the United States doesn't currently earn enough to ever retire, um, afford um, long-term care or elder care for their parents. And that's what created what I call the wilted economy or work incessantly to you drop. So 40% of the country basically their retirement plan is they're just going to die in place. They'll never be able to retire. And so this is why we need um, the National Infrastructure Bank. So path forward is to first, there's a big argument that went on with infrastructure, which is what was needed with one group saying almost nothing was needed. And of course, the other group was saying go big, but both were desperately missing the data of exactly what is the shape of U.S. infrastructure. I personally feel the deficit is somewhere between four and seven to perhaps as many as, as much as $10 trillion that are, are, excuse me, five to $10 trillion. That's um, somewhere between a quarter to 50% of the annual GDP. So how do you tell whether that's correct or not, or not? And the answer is, you basically, you can stand up a system in Department of Homeland Security where agencies all across the country write in and, and uh, tell, um, give basically through a, a form on uh, the web what their current backlogs are and their capital proje projections, just like you would have in any major corporation. And within few, a few months, even plus or minus 20 to 30% accuracy, we be able to do we have a 200 or a $100 billion infrastructure deficit, or do we have a five or $7 trillion infrastructure deficit? And that will then specifically answer the question, is the loan on rebuilding our infrastructure as we would do the uh, National Infrastructure Bank, is that going to, uh, is the loan going to cost more or are you going to lose more through lost productivity and accelerated decrepitude of all of our infrastructure? And then we can also reshore 
um, all of our uh, factories that we've lost offshore, creating millions of jobs. And as I said, uh, create the National Infrastructure Bank, which I see as part of a national barn raising effort to bring the country together and to make us first again. Thank you.